Thank you, Adam, and thank you to the AIC and the ACC for having me here today to speak on this important topic. Um, as you can tell from the majority of the people that have been speaking at this conference, this is something that we're all very passionate about, and uh, I thank you for having me. So just to give you an idea of, of where we fit in the United States uh, law enforcement community, I work for the New York County District Attorney's Office, which is Manhattan proper. Uh, Cyrus R. Vance Jr. is the District Attorney of New York County. Um, each county in New York has an elected District Attorney, and then each District Attorney appoints Assistant District Attorneys. I am uh, an appointed Assistant District Attorney for Mr. Vance. Uh, to give you a little perspective about our office, we have uh, a trial division and an investigations division. The trial division handles summary arrests, generally from any kind of arrest that NYPD generally makes, from jumping a turnstile to murders and rapes and um, cases of that nature. The investigations division, uh, we have nine units in the investigations division. We um, conduct our own investigations in conjunction with many partners, both federal and state. We work a lot with the New York uh, City Police Department, a lot with the United States Secret Service. We work with ICE and other investigative agencies. We have 93 total ADAs in the investigations division, and we have 70 sworn investigators. The investigators are important because these are people that work directly for the district attorney's office and are able to help us with our investigations. It also works very well when we're partnering with outside agencies where we have our own investigators that can participate in surveillance or sitting on uh, an eavesdropping wire. We also have 20 financial investigators, which are basically accountants that uh, help us work on our large white, uh, white collar crime cases. And just to give you an idea about the different um, units in the investigations division, there are nine of them. We have the asset forfeiture unit. As the minister was speaking earlier this morning, uh, my ears sort of perked up when he was talking about how people would rather go to jail than lose the proceeds of their criminal activity. Uh, asset forfeiture is very important um, in preventing these types of crimes and um, causing them, uh, causing criminals to really think about what they're going to do and how they're going to approach these crimes is if they're going to lose all of the assets and the proceeds that they have for making these. Um, as the minister was actually recommending, he was saying that uh, he's proposing legislation that would have uh, the effect where the burden is actually on the people who have the property to prove that they purchased that property legitimately. Um, on the state level where I work, we actually have the burden to prove that the property uh, is the illegal proceeds of the criminal activity, but the federal level has the actual um, statute that the minister was talking about this morning. And I can tell you just from a practical standpoint, the federal aspect works a lot better, and we often partner with the Eastern District and the Southern District to actually seize a lot of the forfeiture that we're working on. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about the Cybercrime and Identity Theft Bureau. I also just want to talk briefly about some of the other uh, units. Uh, the Major Economic Crimes Bureau is our um, investigative division that primarily focuses on white collar crime, including the bank fraud sanction cases that um, uh, ICE was talking about yesterday, and as well as the Money Laundering and Tax Crime Unit handles a lot of uh, money laundering. Um, our Rackets Bureau handles traditional organized crime, such as the mob. Uh, just recently, a month ago, we indicted nine members of the Bonanno crime family for uh, money laundering, for extortion, for sale of drugs and narcotics. Uh, so in New York, uh, the mob still does exist. The Bonanno crime family is one of the original five uh, families in New York that historically have been uh, running the mob and the Rackets. Uh, so just to give you an idea about our jurisdiction, as I said, each county in New York has its own district attorney. Uh, so my jurisdiction is in Manhattan, so we always have to have a nexus to Manhattan. So uh, for white collar crimes, because New York is one of the uh, financial centers of the world, we actually have a lar larger jurisdiction uh, as opposed to um, if you're dealing with homicides and that sort of thing. The only uh, way we have jurisdiction over that is if the actual victim was in Manhattan at the time of the crime. Some other statistics about Manhattan, that Manhattan is only 23 square miles. 
There are approximately 1.6 million people that reside in Manhattan, and uh, I think an amazing stat is that 1.6 million actually grows to approximately 4 million during the day from all of the uh, commuters that are coming in and also from uh, the people that are visiting Manhattan. Uh, New York City itself last year had approximately 52 million people visiting. Um, of that 52 million, approximately 30 uh, million of those people passed through Manhattan. Um, it might be of interest, 11 million uh, of those visitors were international visitors, and uh, all of the uh, visitors accounted for approximately $55 billion impact on the city economy. So facts about my office, the Manhattan District's Attorney's Office, we prosecute over 100,000 crimes a year. Approximately 37% of those crimes last year of the felony complaints that were drafted um, related to charges of identity theft and cybercrime. Some of the precincts in Manhattan report that identity theft is their most frequently reported crime. And to just kind of give you some perspective, uh, violent crime in New York is dropping dramatically. Uh, in the first six months of this year, there have only been uh, a total of 106, um, I'm sorry, 156 homicides. Uh, in Manhattan, there's only been 15 year, uh, this year to date. Uh, that's down from last year, which was at an all-time low, where there was approximately uh, 206 in the first six months, and I think at the end of the year, it finished with about 400 homicides for the year. So um, significantly violent crime is, uh, is dropping in New York. Of course, while violent crime is dropping, uh, prosecutions for cybercrime and identity theft have grown at an alarming rate, up approximately 50% in the past five years. Uh, to give you a kind of perspective, we investigate approximately 200 to 300 new identity theft cases uh, each month. And for the 13th year in a row, the identity theft was the leading consumer complaint in the U.S. in 2012. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how my office combats um, cybercrime and identity theft. Uh, we have a cybercrime and identity theft unit that was started by Mr. Vance in 2010. This uh, unit uh, focuses primarily on crimes relating to uh, the internet, um, specifically on peer-to-peer uh, -peer child porn sharing, on hacking, intrusions, um, also identity theft cases that are carried out through the use of technology. Uh, we also help and assist other people in uh, other trial divisions uh, that are working on sort of traditional crimes such as homicide and rapes and things of that nature that are being carried out in a more sophisticated manner through the use of uh, technology, um, particularly working with uh, cell phones and uh, computers, usually a lot of chats. Um, we have a high technology analysis unit, which I'll talk a little bit more about, which is basically our forensic lab. Uh, we are rather unique in that we, as a, invest as a prosecutor's office, we actually have our own investigators, but we also have our own forensic lab, which makes things very much more efficient. Uh, the NYPD has a forensic lab, uh, but they serve the entire city, and uh, having our own lab allows us to get things at a more efficient manner. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cyber training that we have, uh, that we work with. So a little bit more specific about the Cybercrime Identity Theft Bureau, we have 10 full-time assistants who are dedicated to working on long-term investigations into criminal organizations. We then have uh, 70 additional assistant district attorneys who are in the trial division, and uh, the 10 main district attorneys will then give um, backup support to the 70 additional attorneys who are working on these cases. It's a way to uh, sort of help look at the majority of the cases that we have, and as I said, we have 200 to 300 new ones a month. So we develop our cases through two main ways. The first way is, per, um, is the mining of arrest data. Um, and I can say this is an invaluable tool in discerning the patterns and typologies of these criminal organizations. What happens is each case that is written up, um, each of the ADAs in uh, our felony complaint room will write up cases. And after they're written up, they're sent to the member, the 10 main members of the Cybercrime and Identity Theft Bureau at which point we will review the paperwork that came in and we're looking for things that will show a pattern of criminal activity. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of cases in a little bit and in those cases, uh, they were basically developed out of seeing all the different crimes that were coming into the office and seeing uh, 
what the patterns were and that there were joints and how we could do a better investigation for it. The second thing uh, that we do is we work with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is FinCEN. Um, my understanding is, is that this is the equivalent of Austrac here in Australia. Uh, basically, we have dedicated analysts that review suspicious activity reports and currency transaction reports to uh, mine for cases that we then will investigate. Now, our high technology analyst unit is uh, one of the things that I was talking about earlier with our forensics. Um, and what this has is we have people that will help you in planning your search warrant executions. They will actually go with you when you're executing the search warrant. And then afterward, they will conduct the forensic analysis of uh, the telephones and whatever electronic media that is recovered. So to give you a perspective, in 2008, they had about 639 phones. And by last year, that number had doubled. Um, it gets even worse when you look at computer data where in 2008 we had 24 terabytes of electronic data and by 2012 we had 142. Uh, to give you perspective on that, I believe uh, I was told that uh, the entire printed um, volume of the uh, Library of Congress is only 10 terabytes of data uh, and we would basically have 14 uh, Library of Congresses that we reviewed. Talking a little bit about uh, our cyber training, so we have uh, National White Collar Crime Center, which is NW3C, and prosecution of crimes, uh, of cyber crimes and the collection and use of electronic data. Um, since 2006, approximately 1,500 people have been trained through uh, the Cyber Academy, which represented over 70 different local and federal agencies. Uh, we train assistant district attorneys, we train law enforcement, uh, basically anyone that uh, is interested in learning about these uh, areas, we train them and we train them for free. Um, we also have the Financial Crimes and Cybersecurity Symposium, and this is basically, uh, it's, it's networking. As we've heard from many of the speakers this week, one of the important uh, aspects of dealing with cybercrime is really getting a dialogue going between um, uh, industry and law enforcement and through things such as a cyber crime symposium we are able to meet with people um, generally in the financial sector and discuss commonalities and typologies of the different types of crimes that we are all seeing um, and uh, it's been very successful we also have an outreach program where we go into the community where we try to educate people on cyber crime um, and on organized crime in general so that uh, we can hold hopefully uh, prevent this in the future, and it also builds goodwill in the community uh, so that they're more likely to report these crimes to our office so we can investigate them. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our uh, investigations that we've been working on. Um, as I was saying a little bit earlier, we have our own investigative bureaus, but something that is also unique on the state level, um, our prosecutors are very heavily involved in all of our investigations from the early stages of the investigation. Uh, I think the model, at least on the federal level, is that generally you have an investigative agency such as the FBI or ICE or the Secret Service who conduct an investigation and bring the investigation once it's completed to the prosecutor, at which point the prosecutor's office uh, indicts it and, and handles the prosecution of the case. On the state level, our prosecutors are actually the ones conducting the investigation in conjunction with the uh, law enforcement partners. So a J-1 uh, student visa investigation was a rather interesting case um, because it had many multiple layers and it was international. Basically, hackers from Eastern Europe were targeting people not only in the United States, but primarily in the United States uh, with emails. It was basically spam emails that once people clicked on the email, they had malware embedded on their computers. And the malware had a um, program that was basically recording the um, typing um, once you were on, I'm sorry, <clears throat> once they logged onto their computers, it would record the, um, it would record the typing and record the account information, uh, at which point they would then uh, have your information for your bank accounts. The stolen account information was then used to take over the victim's account, and uh, unauthorized money transactions were made from that account over into Mule accounts. 
you can see sort of the, where this was coming from. The virus was from Eastern Europe. It was coming to the victim's computer in the United States. Once the money got into, uh, I'm sorry, once the victim's computer was infected, they would take the victim's bank account information. They would then transfer the money into a cyber mule account, and then that money would be sent over to, uh, back to Eastern Europe. Now, the interesting part was the cyber mules were actually all students that uh, had J-1 visas. In the United States, a J-1 visa allows you to come over for a period of time so you can complete your studies. Um, and we had a lot of people that were coming from Russia and the Ukraine, and uh, they would come over, they would be recruited in Russia before they actually came here. There were websites and social media sites that were advertising uh, quick paying jobs in the United States. They would be instructed to open up an account, and once the account was opened, um, they, after they had finished their studies, so when the visa was about to expire, they would then receive information that they were going to get money transferred into their account, once it was transferred into their account, they would immediately withdraw it and then hand it off to their handler, and then they would leave uh, the country. They would receive a percentage of the money that they withdrew uh, upon successful completion of turning it over to their handler. Um, so this was, uh, it was a challenging investigation that, uh, that we were working on because, again, most of the mules, once they had the money in their accounts, they were disappearing. Um, and going back to Europe right away, which made it difficult to sort of follow the money trail. What we uh, ultimately did, we had an investigation with the FBI, where the FBI was looking into the malware, where they were trying to find the source of the, um, of the emails, where it was coming from. We then had summary arrests by NYPD, and this was basically, they were getting calls from banks. It didn't take too long for the banks to realize what was happening here, and so what they would do is they would flag accounts that had been opened with a J-1 visa as uh, some of the identifying information. Um, and once those accounts were open, if they saw something that sort of fit the pattern where there was a very low amount of money in the account and then suddenly uh, money entered the account and then that same day that the money entered it was withdrawn, uh, the bank started alerting NYPD to this. NYPD then made some summary arrests. Once the people were arrested, they then came to our office and that's how we got involved in the investigation. At that point, what we were doing is we were attempting to speak with the defendants and uh, they, uh, of course, have a right to uh, not incriminate themselves, according to the Fifth Amendment. Some of them did speak to us, however. Um, and uh, what we would also do, uh, because a lot of the debriefings were not uh, that efficient, is we did a lot of forensic examinations. Um, because these people were really uh, planning on leaving the country right away, a lot of times they actually had their cell phones on them and their computers, uh, which allowed us to get search warrants for those devices, which allowed us to then build out the, uh, the investigation. What we found is that the victims were spread across the United States. There were multiple banks involved. Uh, one of the main banks that we dealt with, because it's located in New York County, was J.P. Morgan Chase. They had over $850,000 worth of fraud in, I think it was something like a two-month period. Um, we were able to indict 55 people in conjunction with the Southern District of New York. Uh, we were literally pulling people off of planes uh, as they were trying to leave the country. Um, it was a very successful operation from our point of view. The, uh, the only downside is that we were not able to identify who was actually sending the malicious software from uh, Eastern Europe. Operation Black Rain uh, was a very fun uh, investigation that I worked on. Uh, basically, we had waiters at high-end restaurants in uh, New York County, such as Smith & Walensky and the Capitol Grill and Morton's, Wolfgang's, um, who were stealing victims' credit card information using a small handheld device referred to as a skimmer. Uh, in the picture, Mr. Vance is actually holding uh, a skimmer in his hand. Now, uh, I understand in Australia this probably would not happen because if you go into a restaurant, they, uh, the waiters will actually skim your credit card in front of you. Uh, in New York, in most places in the United States, it's common for a waiter to take your credit card back to a point of sale system and, uh, and ring you up that way so that it's actually not in front of you. And so what the waiters would do that were in on this is they would take uh, the skimming device in their hand, they would take your credit card, they'd go back to an area where no one could see them, and then they'd swipe the credit card through the skimming device and thereby record the electronic data that was on the magnetic strip. Um, 
Specifically, the reason why we called it Operation Black Rain is because these uh, individuals were actually targeting um, black car, uh, American Express black cards, which have uh, no limit. So they were trying to get the more bang for the buck, and literally they were making it rain with the amount of money they were making. Um, so what? Uh, what they would do is once they'd skim the cards, they would pass the cards on to the director of the criminal enterprise. That individual uh, would make forged credit cards. The forged credit cards were then distributed to uh, a network of shoppers and managers. The managers would oversee the work that the shoppers were doing. The shoppers would go and hit uh, high-end stores, uh, generally electronics or um, high-end ladies' handbags, things that they could sell for a big profit. That um, all of that stolen property would then go back to the director who would then sell it at generally about 50% of the value. Uh, and they were making a killing doing this. Um, so at the end of the investigation, ultimately we were able to indict 29 defendants, 15 for enterprise corruption, which is uh, our organized uh, crime law, which is basically the state equivalent of the RICO, uh, uh, the RICO law and we are able to indict 14 for conspiracy and grand larceny. Um, so the investigation into how this actually occurred, uh, once again, this was a series of summary arrests where we were able to, through reviewing the facts of the case, we were able to come up with a typology that these uh, defendants were engaged in. And basically what they were doing is, uh, again, it was always black cards or platinum cards from American Express, which made it a little bit easier to target them. Um, American Express was, uh, was a great partner in this case. We actually went to American Express and told them what we were seeing on our end. And uh, it was actually sort of interesting. Some of the defendants, in addition to buying the merchandise that I'm telling you about, they were also then using the money to go get spa treatments. So uh, we basically were able to say to American Express, if you see this activity where you see a number of high-end purchases and you see a spa treatment, please let us know. Um, <laughs> Uh, another aspect that we actually uh, saw that was interesting that ultimately we were able to determine what they were doing, they also, before they would make the high-end purchases, there was generally either a taxi uh, charge or a charge at Starbucks. Uh, what we finally came to, to figure out was that they were actually testing the card to see if it worked before they actually went and made the purchases. So we basically went back to American Express, told them, pull us all the cases that you've seen um, in the New York area that actually shows this type of uh, typology. Um, from going through those records, we then actually saw that this was a national uh, chain. They had uh, shoppers that were in New York, in Chicago, Boston, Los Angeles, Florida. They basically flew all over the country uh, committing these crimes. And when they were doing it, they actually were getting reimbursed then uh, for, their, for their flights. It was, it was a real enterprise where they actually had to keep receipts for things that they legitimately paid for, which was unbelievable. So Andrew Pollack was actually one of the original people that started this investigation. Uh, Andrew Pollack was sort of a sad sack of an individual uh, in his 30s, still living at home with his mom. Um, and uh, Andrew also had the problem that he was not very good at his job. Um, he kept getting arrested going out and using these credit cards. And so he was arrested, I think, four times. And every time that he was arrested, uh, I tried to speak with him. And um, each time he declined to speak with me, he kept saying, well, maybe I will. And then he'd go before a judge, and because it was a nonviolent crime, the judge would generally release Andrew. So once Andrew got released, he had no interest in speaking with me until he got arrested again, uh, at which point, uh, I think on the fourth time, the judge finally decided that he was going to keep him in jail. So while Andrew was in jail, um, one of the uh, interesting things about, uh, about New York, about our prisons, is that we actually record all of the phone calls um, of, all of, the, uh, all of the inmates. And the inmates are actually told that your phone call is going to be recorded. When you start, when they get on the phone, it says, you know, this phone call may be recorded. There's a gigantic sign in the cell where the phone is located that says your phone may be recorded. And yet, these individuals still like to talk on the phone. So, uh, Andrew, I'm going to play a quick uh, clip for you. And at this point in the investigation, we were still trying to learn where the, uh, one, we were trying to learn who was in charge of this, and two, where was the, uh, 
where were the crimes actually, I'm sorry, where were the cards actually being skimmed? One of the most important things when you're doing one of these types of investigations is to develop the uh, point of compromise. For what? I work as a fucking, whatever I have to do. Oh, it'll be so dangerous. It's not dangerous at all. It's one person who's, who's the head of everything. It's not dangerous at all, let me tell you. Who's that, Franco? No. Guess again. DJ? Franco had nothing to do with anything. DJ? Yep. He's the head of everything? Yep. This is what he does for a living? Yep. Hmm? Yep. And he's never gone to jail? Nope. No, oh, he's smart. Fucking pimp. He gets people to do his dirty work? Yep. So what's with the watches? That's a side thing. That's also crooked. Take it out sooner. I have to figure it out. What to do? Are you I sure they're here. letting you out? They offered me before. I don't see why they won't offer me again. Now I have, I'll give them even more. What more will you give them? I have a lot to give. Hmm? A lot of restaurants to give, if I have to. What do you mean restaurants? I'll explain to you some other time. Ask the lawyer to explain it to you. Or ask Lenny to explain it to you. So Andrew Pollack uh, just gave us the information. Okay, so DJ is in charge of this. So now we just had to identify who DJ was, but at least now we had a name. Um, he also, very important, at the end of that clip, he then said restaurants were involved, which then actually gave us an idea about, okay, where's the point of compromise? So with that information, we went back to American Express and we said, okay, now what we want you to do is all of these cards that we have that have been compromised, where we have the uses, uh, I want you to run common uh, points of purchase and uh, please focus on restaurants. From that, they were able to pull a number of the restaurants that we saw, including one that was Capitol Grill, from the Capitol Grill, we saw that in November of 2010, there were approximately um, 17 cards that uh, had been used at Capitol Grill at that time, and then four months later were, uh, were used for fraud. Uh, at that point, it gave us a good idea that there was someone at the Capitol Grill that was skimming. Uh, we spoke with Capitol Grill, we were able to get their employment records and we were able to find out uh, an individual by the name of Daniel Burns was, uh, was the person that was the waiter for 14 out of the 17 cards and for the other three cards he was actually working at that time. So that gave us a pretty good idea that Dan was the, uh, was the person. Uh, so we arrested Dan. He had a cell phone on him. From his cell phone, we got 17,000 text messages. I don't think the man ever deleted a single text message. <laughs> the 17,000 text messages actually outlined uh, sort of the, uh, the, the, the structure of the criminal enterprise. And the nice part was is that almost everyone else in the enterprise were using drop phones that were coming back to anonymous names. Uh, Dan, of course, was using his own phone, so uh, thank God for stupid criminals. And um, from that, we were actually able to see that there was an individual in there that had uh, the name of DJ. And DJ, um, when we had the phone number, we were actually able to trace that back to a phone number that had been calling Andrew Pollack when he was actually in jail. So this is uh, DJ on the left, and on the right is Anthony Mara, also known as Little Anthony. Um, I'm going to play a clip uh, from an eavesdropping wire that uh, we had on DJ's phone. And uh, there's a couple of important things that uh, I'm going to point out but after I play it. But first, I'm going to apologize for some of the language that is, uh, is going to come out. Of course, they didn't know that they were being recorded at the time. He, lost, he, he just lost chain of command. I'm the new chain of command. And Anthony's not on the team. Greg's not on the team. At worst case scenario, I got the perfect fucking team. I got the perfect fucking team. Oh, I mean, if you're interested, let's meet up tomorrow. We'll sit down and talk in person about it. I, I mean, listen, I, to, I, to, I told, and I, you don't even know, like I said to him, I said, listen, brother, listen to me. Please don't get caught. We're going to do a million dollars in business. Do you know, do you know, this kid, do you know that, I don't know, maybe he got like some type of embarrassment, but if he was smart, he would have just sat down to all of us and said, listen, I can't handle being chain of command. Can you pass it on to somebody else? 
Why, why was it so hard to even fall? Father, why, you why know what? Wait for this to happen. He, 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 I said to him, I said to him, do you know how much money you're costing your guys? I said, little Anthony probably did 150000 in business. I know how much he did in business because I paid him. And I know what he's done in one day. He did like $20,000 just last week on a couple of watches and gift cards. Anthony, you did. You, you really did. It's not, and it's not the first time. You've done a lot of work, and you, and he's cost you a lot of work. You could be, you could have like thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars already. You should have had. I, I mean, listen, I know how much you've done. I know you've done a great job, but you could have doubled it. You should have had thirty. You should have had thirty thousand. You know. Now he doesn't understand that he puts me in a fucking pickle. Why does he put me in a pickle? Because I get those not the one I have to deal with it. Those cards come out of a restaurant. The girl or the guy that gave us those cards, they have to stop working now. They cannot grab cards. They have to stop. That means that they're pissed. You know why they're pissed? He doesn't understand. When he fucks up, you don't fuck it for yourself. You fuck it up for everybody. Right. This, these people, it's a, it's a guy with a fucking wife and kids, and he makes $4,000 a month. This guy's you know done. Is? Rick, Rick, this Rick guy's done. Home. Rick lives at home with his fucking mother. He has nothing. Nobody can worry about. He has nobody to worry about. I have a girlfriend who we just found out has breast cancer, who, whose parents both died, who both of her parents died a couple of years ago, and she's the guardian. Me and her are the guardian of her little 18-year-old brother who's the best kid in the world. So to me, that's my only family. My family, who I live with, they're, they're not my family. Everybody turned it back to me years ago. My family is my girl and her little brother. And Rick's not only hurt me, he's hurt my family. And when you hurt my family, I'm going to hurt you. I don't mean, understand that because he's just he, he his mother and his I'm sister. Gonna, it's ridiculous. We should, you know, listen, this is, I keep saying to Rick, look, if I put you on a street corner with a kilo of cocaine and told you to sell it off, you'd have a higher risk and you wouldn't make the money as fast as you're making it now. Guarantee, if I, put, if I gave you a kilo of cocaine and said to you, here, you still have to pay me back for the kilo, you still have to pay me back my interest, and you still have to, and you have a higher risk, and you wouldn't be able to sell it fast enough. I said, you think that you'd be able to get the money that you guys got that weekend in the Hamptons? That fucking week, that fucking one day in the Hamptons, the money that you guys make, you think that there's guys making that kind of money out there? There ain't a lot, brother. I'm gonna tell you the truth. There ain't a lot. I got I got friends that move up heavy weight, and they don't make that kind of money. Guarantee, not in one day. You guys can make you guys made three thousand dollars in one day. You did twenty five thousand and about eight thousand. You did thirty three thousand dollars in one afternoon. You took home three thousand three hundred dollars in one afternoon. You didn't have to lay a cent out of your pocket. It was one hundred percent your. 100% pure profit. That's the point of that entire uh, tirade that DJ went on. Um, and it's true, and it's what we've been talking about all, uh, all conference, is that basically these people are going to commit these crimes because they're making a lot of money. One of the things that uh, we're trying to do in New York is to basically play this clip for as many people as we can in the legislature um, to basically show that these are not people that are just committing crimes because they're sad sacks. They're actually committing these crimes because of the profit in it. And uh, everything that DJ was talking about in terms of a kilo of cocaine, he was absolutely right. Uh, you would, they would not have gotten the same return on selling it on the street corner, and they would have had a much higher risk. Uh, a kilo of cocaine in New York, selling that would be a, an A1 felony, uh, which carried uh, a minimum of 15 and a maximum of 25 years in jail. The felony that I ultimately was able to indict DJ on and that he pled to was enterprise corruption, which uh, the minimum amount of jail time was, would have been uh, one and a third to four. The maximum would have been uh, eight and a third to 25. Uh, the judge in uh, my case, uh, we had DJ plead to the enterprise corruption, grand larceny, uh, about 15 different crimes all said, and the judge sentenced him to four and a third to 13. Um, the amount of money that these guys made in a prolonged period of time was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, they really didn't save any of the money. The money was basically being spent as soon as they got it. Um, all that being said, we were still able to uh, seize and forfeit approximately a million dollars in cash and, 
<clears throat> and approximately a million dollars worth of merchandise. Um, down at the left, you can see we were able to find the credit card plant where they were making the credit cards. Uh, you can see the, uh, the embosser and the skimmer and the computers and the printers, everything that's necessary to make the cards. My favorite is uh, on the top right bottom picture, there is uh, the credit card embosser, the machine that you need to use to raise the credit card numbers on the cards. And actually in the machine was a forged Amex card when we went in and, and seized it. Um, one of the frustrations that law enforcement has in the United States is that every uh, piece of equipment that you see in that photo is actually legal to purchase. There are about three companies in the United States that uh, sell how-to. Uh, they sell all of these um, devices legally and they basically, there's websites that you can go online and you can learn about how to commit this type of fraud. Uh, it is really the easiest thing that, uh, that you can learn how to do. These two pictures uh, I wanted to, to put up because uh, what we're seeing in New York is a lot of our gangs are actually going into credit card making. Um, these individuals up here were actually involved in a forged um, check ring. And uh, what's significant about this is you see they're all holding money. Uh, one individual has a forged uh, credit card in his hand. Uh, these pictures you used to see for drug dealers where they were celebrating the gangster lifestyle. Now we're actually seeing it with credit card fraud, where we have individuals that used to be involved in uh, selling drugs um, are now selling forged credit cards and uh, merchandise purchased with forged documents because of the amount of money that they can make and because when they get caught, uh, frankly, the sentencing is not as severe. Uh, S3 is a, another credit card um, group that we investigated. Um, this is actually, it's an ice sculpture that they had made uh, when they were celebrating their leader getting out of prison. Uh, he had been in prison for a, uh, for a credit card, forged credit card, where the judge sentenced him to a year. While he was in prison, he was still conducting the activities of the gang. The gang was actually based in, uh, in Brooklyn, but they did the majority of their purchases in Manhattan because uh, that's where more of the high-end stores were. Um, basically, they made over a million dollars um, doing this. Uh, now, they got their credit cards from a carding forum, so they were purchasing the cards online. We did a number of search warrants on email addresses that were able to, uh, we were able to link to the uh, actual defendants. Um, as a result of this uh, investigation, um, 14 people were indicted for conspiracy and grand larceny. The leader of the... Uh, of the group uh, will be able to have another ice sculpture celebrating his release in the next five to 15 years. Uh, what we're also seeing a lot of is um, ATM and gas station skimming, where they're actually taking uh, homemade devices made to look like the outside of the ATM or the gas pump, and they're placing those on the uh, machines. Uh, interestingly enough, we've had a lot of foreign nationals coming into the United States to do this, where they fly in and uh, they use the cards that are created and they try and cash out as much as they can. Recently, we've had people from uh, Bulgaria and the Ukraine, and um, when we actually, when we arrest them, we try and catch them as quick as possible because we know that there's always a handler with them. And uh, the most recent arrest we were able to make, we followed the handler back to the hotel room. We executed search warrants there, and we were able to recover six, recover six hundred thousand uh, dollars. So again, it's very profitable uh, what these guys are doing, and they can do it in a very quick amount of time. Uh, the last case I'm going to talk about is Western Express International. Western Express was a company that was uh, founded actually in Manhattan by uh, two Russian citizens and someone from the Ukraine. Um, the business basically catered to carters. Those were the individuals who traffic and stolen credit card information. Um, Western Express, we got a complaint in Manhattan that an individual's credit card had been uh, used fraudulently and that the money was tied through... Uh, a e-gold account to Western Express. With that information, we started conducting an investigation into Western Express, and uh, what we actually found was Western Express, although they were engaging in some of the carding um, information, they were also cashing checks. Now, in under New York State banking law, you have to um, you have to be licensed by New York State in order to engage in uh, money remitting, basically in cashing checks. Um, Western Express was doing this without being licensed. 
Um, so as a result of that, we were able to um, indict them for unlicensed check cashing and money transmitting and also falsifying business records. Once we were able to indict them, we, uh, in conjunction with the Secret Service, were able to uh, execute search warrants on seven locations where we received uh, one room just full of documents, but about 25, it was about 25, between 25 and 50 computers and um, about 100 cell phones. And uh, from the forensic examination of those uh, devices, we were able to see that uh, Western Express was basically facilitating the purchase of um, credit card data internationally. Uh, they were actually advertising on carding forums their services, and what they would do is they would uh, exchange currency for digital currency. The digital currency that they were doing was e-gold, and um, they would uh, then ha allow people to basically pass through them to purchase the credit card data, and then once the credit card data was used to purchase uh, whatever devices or whatever items they were going to send, the proceeds then passed through them back to the people that had originally sold all of the uh, um, carding information in the first place. All of the names that they were basically associated with, a lot of the vendors were basically created under fake names associated with prepaid uh, cell phones and uh, emails in, in fictitious names. Uh, or they would also use money orders, which didn't require them to uh, record the name of the information that was actually passing the money. Um, so from this, we were, we were able to indict them on a much larger uh, money laundering scheme and again with enterprise corruption. Um, now. In New York, enterprise corruption, you have to show that there's an ascertainable structure. And uh, in the clip earlier where I had DJ talking with Anthony Mara, DJ's talking about the chain of command. And there's a hierarchy that was involved in the people that were involved in it. You had DJ who was creating the cards. You had the managers who were working with the shoppers who were out picking the stuff up, giving it back to the managers. There was very clearly a hierarchy that was involved with it. With Western Express, there, wasn't as, there was not a hierarchy. Basically, what we had was we had uh, a number of different people that had set roles. So you had the people that were involved in getting the credit card information. You had the people who were actually making the cards. And you had Western Express that was facilitating what was going on. And this is fairly common. It's a fairly common example for, um, for the way these cyber rings work particularly when you're dealing with international uh, operatives such as this. Unfortunately, um, the New York Court of Appeals, which is our highest court, um, dismissed the enterprise corruption count, finding that um, we did not have an ascertainable structure. In a telling moment, um, the, one of the justices actually said that what we proved was that there was a corrupt industry, but not that this was one enterprise. Um, so it was a blow to us um, because it really would be, I think, the example on how to prosecute these types of cases. Um, so it dismissed the enterprise corruption count, but it left 155 other charges. Um, there were 18 people that were originally indicted, um, 17 people and, and, and Western Express, the, the corporation itself. Of the 17, only three people went to trial. The trial just ended in June. They were convicted of all 155 counts. And the uh, judge just sentenced one of the people involved for uh, to 10 to 20 years, which was the maximum that he could sentence. So although it was disappointing to have, worse than, uh, to have enterprise corruption dismissed, it was still a good model going forward. All right, and just finally, I'm just going to touch on some of the uh, cybercrime trends that we're actually seeing in the office. Um, right now, we're seeing distributed denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks, where basically um, traffic is, is targeted at an individual or a company's website so that they uh, try and overwhelm the site. They basically bombard the website with traffic, usually of uh, retailers or financial um, service providers, in an effort to basically cause their website to crash. Um, and we're seeing a lot of these investigations. One of the issues that uh, we're having with this type of, of case is that a lot of the banks um, are 
weary about telling us about it because they don't want the bad press associated with it. So this is one of those things where we are, again, trying to get into a partnership with the financial institutions by going out and speaking to them and uh, just trying to get more information so that we can uh, do these investigations. Then we also have point of sale system hacks, which basically um, we had, uh, there were a couple companies in the United States that were providing the point of sale computer systems for a lot of our retailers. Uh, what we found was uh, there was one particular system in general that was being attacked very often and information was being stolen from it. Um, and uh, we think really the, the reason why is because there was um, a backdoor password into the, uh, the systems that the, uh, that the uh, creator had, had put in, so in case there was ever any problems. All of the retailers were told to change the password, and it turned out that the majority of them did not. So one person found the backward password into the system, basically used that to hack into multiple systems and steal the uh, personal identifying information of thousands of people. And then finally, the other uh, types of uh, uh, the other types of, of crimes that we're now investigating are all dealing with the virtual currency, and basically uh, we're looking at those for money laundering and, of course, the. Uh, Southern District and uh, the Secret Service recently announced uh, the, the takedown of Liberty Reserve, and that uh, is a model that our office and many of the other prosecutors' offices in the country are following. So that, uh, that is my talk. So if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer some. <laughs>